Welcome everyone and thank you for choosing to hop online this weekend for our message. Uh, we're excited to have you listening in. We hope that it will be a blessing for you. Uh, we do have a quick announcement before the message this week. Uh, we recognize, along with many of you, that Governor Reynolds did come out with some new updates with regards to the COVID guidelines uh, and expectations for the state of Iowa. We also recognize that within that, she's given churches and other religious organizations a lot of leeway and a lot of flexibility. Uh, and we have a ton of respect for what she's doing uh, and just the tight place that she's got to be in right now. And so in respect to what she is doing in support of churches and other religious organizations, we want to um, be respectful and mindful of her in that. And so we're going to continue forward with our 8 a.m. mask only service at the chapel at 8 a.m. on Sunday mornings. And so that's here at the church building at 8 a.m. on Sunday mornings in the chapel for a mask only service. We're going to continue forward with our 9.30 a.m. service at the Y with a few minor changes. And so we're going to add a little bit more spacing uh, between the chairs. And then we're um, also we're continuing to ask that uh, if you are ill, that if you're feeling sick, that you please stay home and watch the services online. And then if, if you think you've been around someone maybe uh, that is ill or has had COVID, um, if you plan on coming to the 9.30 a.m. service, we, we recommend that you wear a mask. Again, this is all in response to what Governor Reynolds is doing and want to be respectful and mindful of the support that she's shown us uh, and sh show our respect back to her by doing these few things. So whether it's online or in person this weekend, uh, we're excited to have you listening in. We're excited for the time that you're spending with us. We hope you have a great weekend. Uh, enjoy the message. Many of you can relate to this story of a dad who's working in the backyard. This, this particular dad has this project where he's trying to make steps with these big stones that are like between 100 and 200 pounds, right? So it's like everything he has to try to like move them into place. He's using some tools kind of like for leverage to kind of like get them into place to make these like steps in his backyard. Well, of course, his five-year-old daughter, and many of you can relate to this, says, hey, daddy, 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 I wanna help. And he's like, okay, great, maybe you can sing. Yeah, sing some songs for daddy, that'll encourage him and keep him going and keep his spirits high. And she says, no, no, daddy, I wanna help. So with a little bit of reluctance, you know, if he gets the, the stone in, in kind of the right place where it's, it's very safe, he lets her put her hands on it as he's like maneuvering the stone to, to get it into place. Now he'd be the first to say that her help um, was not much of a help. In fact, it, it was more of a hindrance than it was a help, right? Uh, it was, it, 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 he could have done it faster, he could have done it easier than without her help. But at the end of the day, not only did he have some brand new stones, but he also had a daughter who was beaming with pride and said, Daddy and I built steps today. <laughs> I know many of you can relate to that kind of a story. I have nieces and nephews that have come on over with my brother to do some house projects and getting them, you know, trying to get stuff for them to get involved. It's like sometimes it's more work <laughs> when they're around, but it's so much fun because at the end of the day, they're like, oh, we did this and this and this. So today I have, we're gonna be talking about something that, you know, if you're a non-Christian watching this, it might be a little weird. Like this topic has always been a little weird for you because we're, we're gonna be talking about prayer. Prayer to you has maybe always befounded you. You're like, I don't really get it. Like, who are you really talking to? What are you really doing? Is it like you're, you're talking to somebody to try to get stuff, like a genie in a lamp or whatever? And if you're a Christian, uh, we're talking about prayer today, but I don't want you to check out right away because you're like, ah, prayer, I kind of, you know, been a Christian for a while, heard a lot of things about prayer. I, I really think that we might be taking a different, a different area, a different direction today. And, and to kind of highlight that direction, um, I want to say that when we're talking about prayer, I want us to start thinking about prayer as the act of seeing the world from God's point of view. And maybe that helps you too if you're a non-Christian listening to this, okay, 
prayer, seeing the, you know, they believe in a, if you're not a Christian, we believe in a God, right? But seeing the world from God's point of view, what, what does that look like? It's not some performance prayer often, you know, especially if you've been coming to church maybe a little while, you know, there seems like there's certain times in the service where, where prayer is used. So is it like, is it like a spoken word piece, like a poem, like people write it down and then it's like a performance that they do for other people? No, 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 no. Prayer is the act of seeing the world from God's point point of view. I spend time with my friends, right? Um, Not because of what they can give to me or for me or do for me, but because I enjoy their company. And this is something that I think we're lacking so much in prayer. So many times, so many of us, it's just like, God, what? I need this. God, I need this. God, what are you doing about this? Why, why, you know, change this. And we forget about just this relationship that we can have with God, that, that we should be spending time with Him because we enjoy His company, and that's what we get to do when we pray. Prayer is not about gaining wishes or magical powers or, or to make life easier, but prayer is about knowing God. But don't be misled because I think uh, we also we lose this all the time. And I'm seeing very specific examples of this that we'll get to later of ways we don't pray thinking that prayer changes anything. If we don't believe that prayer changes anything, then prayer is meaningless. It's just some empty words. I, if, if I'm a kind of ashamed that this week when and thinking about this, this message, looking back at my prayer life, I, I bet if you recorded a transcript of all my prayers, I don't know if you read those over, if you'd really think that Dave Chase believes that prayer changes things. That's, that's embarrassing. Maybe you can relate. Maybe your prayers have really become hollow, where you don't believe that prayer... Does it really make a difference? Does it really change things? What if the main thing that prayer was supposed to change was ourselves? What if the main thing that when I spent time with God, God, right, the creator of the world, Lord and master over all things, that you'd think that time spent with him would change me right? We often are praying prayers that we're asking God, hey, God changed this. You change. I don't like the way something is that's going on right now. You change. But what if the main thing about prayer was how it was to change us? <laughs> are, are we so great that time spent with God that God would come away different? <laughs> uh, I'm worried right now because I'm seeing very specific examples of how Christians are putting their hope in things besides God. And we're not, we're not praying as prayers that, that come away with this hope of, I've spent time with God, I'm different, I know that God's in control and I have hope in God. But we come away with prayers like, you know, God's not changing this and I just have no hope. Well, we have a very specific passage today, you know, in this series that, that Carrie's been leading us through, we've been, um, in this series, we've been talking about um, lessons learned from Jesus. We've been going through the book of Luke, and um, it's just been great, you know, learning all these different lessons from Jesus. Jesus has this very specific lesson he wants us to learn today, and in the passage, he'll actually tell us, and for once, for once, he will actually tell us the lesson that he wants us to learn. Uh, let's turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 1 says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable, which it's a parable is a story. So he's telling them a story. And so this is Luke recording this story about Jesus, who's about ready to tell a story. (laughs) Um, So Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. So this judge, he's not like he's a bad judge, but he's not like, he's not like a good person maybe, or, or he's not at least a, a Christian or a follower or a Jew uh, in, this, in this setting. 
And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because the widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. <laughs> and the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for, her, for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? There's this question, like, not only that, Jesus ends this parable with a question, which doesn't always happen, this, this idea that Jesus is asking, when the Son of Man comes, is he going to find this faith on earth? Is he going to find people praying? Is he going to find people praying and not giving up, or will have everybody given up? We see right at the beginning, Jesus says that he, he tells them this story to show them that they should always pray and not give up. To pray and not give up. He's telling them the story, and he tells it right, right out to all of us why he's telling this story. And, and the point is, is that this judge who's even not a good judge would eventually get worn out by this. And we see this example. Um, I, and Kenneth Bailey cites a scene witnessed by a Western traveler in 19th century Iraq. And so there, the story goes where there's like on this slightly raised dais sat this Kadi, or, or that'd be a judge. Uh, he was half buried in cushions. And around him uh, squatted various secretaries and other notice, notables. The, the, the crowds were crowding around him and they were all like kind of you know, yelling and raising their voices, uh, clamoring at once, each claiming that their cause needed his attention, this judge's attention right away. But you kind of notice on the outskirts of the crowd, some of the more seasoned people there knew kind of how to get around this. And they weren't, they weren't cl trying to clamor for the, the, the attention of the Kadi. They were going around to some of his like secretaries uh, and they were passing bribes, although they would euphemistically call them fees, right? <laughs> and so they were passing the hands into uh, one or another. And when the greed of the underlings was satisfied, one of them would whisper to the Kadi who would promptly call such and such a case. Now, it seemed to be ordinarily understood that whoever kind of bribed or, or gave the highest fee, my bad, <laughs> gave the highest fee, um, usually would win. That's who the judgment would go for. But meantime, there's this, he's telling the story, and this is 19th century Iraq, where there's a widow on the very back of this room, right? So you have all this crowd trying to like, hey, my case needs to be here. And you have these, these people that are kind of whispering these bribes, these underlings. But then on the very back, you have this poor widow, right? Who's day after day showing up and raising her voice. And, and whenever there's a pause, shouting, you know, trying to get her voice heard, right? And um, the Kadi, you know, he, he, bids her to be silent. He, he reproachfully tells her that, why are you coming here every day? You know, you just you need to stop, like you need to go and shuts her down, right? And, and she says, and so I will keep coming here every day, she cried out, till the Kadi hears me. At length, at the end of such end of a suit, the judge impatiently demanded, what does the woman want? Her story was soon told, and it was that um, she, had, she was a widow and her only son had been taken for a soldier, right? And she was alone and could not take care of her land. She could not plow it and, 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 and lay seed in it and, and get crops to grow. Uh, she was all by herself. But yet the tax gatherer had forced her to pay the impost. But since she was a lone widow, she should be able to be exempt from the impost. Well, the judge asked a few more questions and then said, let her be exempt. And so then her perseverance pays off. And this is the story of 19th century Iraq, right? Where her perseverance still wears down this judge. It's almost, almost word for word of what's happening here. We see this around us that time, you know, time after time with this persistence, it pays off. So what is that about prayer? How does this relate? Uh, we, some of you might be thinking, some of you more veterans, seasoned veterans, might be thinking about Matthew chapter six, where it says, you know, do not pray with, with so many words. And so it's like, well, shouldn't, God already kind of knows what I, what I need, what I want, uh, what's going on. Why should I be persistent in this? And, and, and this is not a contradiction with Matthew chapter six, because Matthew chapter six is talking more against like repetitious prayers and, and, and these long-witted, especially 
um, in light of being with other people. Like, hey, I want everybody else to hear my, my many big, lustrous words, right? But here he's speaking about the strength of a prayer. In this, he's, he's talking about that petitioners before God are not heard for their many words, but they are heard for their sincere cry before God. That their persistence is a showing that this matters. Not that if I pray long enough, hard enough, if I keep praying, then eventually God will grant me my wishes or desires. John Artborg says that, um, one of God's most amazing attributes is that he is humble enough. God, God being humble, he shouldn't have to be, he's God, right? But God is humble enough to accept people when they turn to him in sheer desperation, even when they have been ignoring him for years. <laughs> uh, some military people will say that there's no, there's no atheists in foxholes. <laughs> Everybody in a foxhole and stuff's going down around them, um, they'll turn to a God They'll pray. Prayer is something that we need to practice at, though. Um, it is something that, that we can learn and that we can get better at. Again, it's not a performance, right? But it's kind of like a musical instrument. I don't ex I'm not very musically talented, so I don't expect to pick up any instrument and just be able to play it and play my favorite song off it right off the bat, right? No, I would have to practice at it. I'd have to practice at music even, just generally music and becoming better at being able to play any instrument, let alone that specific instrument, and I'd have to practice at it and work at it. And so maybe for you, that if, if you've seen some prayers unanswered in your own life, hopefully that's an encouraging thought that well, yeah, but I haven't really practiced that prayer. I haven't really practiced at being sincere in my prayers, at, at, at the, the sincere cry of my heart within prayers. And we'll get to a little bit of some things that, that, that you should be doing when you're praying. Um, but with prayer, it doesn't always happen right away. And then we blame God for that. Are we willing, are you willing, am I willing, to batter the gates of heaven with our prayers. Not because, again, not because of with our many words and our, our persistence that we'll finally get what we want, but because of that persistence, it's often in that persistence, that we're coming back around to this, often through that persistence, prayer ends up changing us. It's through that persistent and constant prayer that we show God how important a thing is to us, but also it's through that persistent prayer and that time spent with God where we end up seeing the world from God's point of view that he ends up sometimes just giving us insight to see, this is why I'm giving you the answer I'm giving you. But we don't like that. If it's not our answer, we don't want anything to do with that, and we don't want anything to do with that God. That's not how prayer works. Jesus is teaching us here. Jesus is the one who's saying, I wanna teach them to pray and to not give up. Because prayer, consistent, persistent, constant battering the gates of heaven with our prayers is what can change the world. And oftentimes that change starts with us. Do we truly care about what we are praying about? Do we, not God, see the whole picture, because God definitely sees the whole picture. Are we willing in the midst of our battering to let prayer change us? Are we willing to trust God that he has a clearer picture than what than we do of the situation? And it's through that persistent prayer that my own desires, plans gradually harmonize with God's. So again, I ask this again, does persistent prayer matter enough to you? The real value of persistent prayer is not so much that we get what we want, as that we become the type of person that we should become. Uh, the young adult uh, college age and young adult group that, that meets on Tuesday night here, I meet with them, they're, they're really kind of type, kind of honing in on that thought of becoming the type of person. It, we're, we're talking about some uh, love, dates, and, and heartbreaks is the name of the series that we're watching, the sermon series, where Andy Stanley kind of points out the, this myth that we have when we're dating, this myth of the right person myth. We often think that when we're dating somebody, it's like, well, if I find the right person, I, I won't have to be a patient kind or, or I won't have to be like slow to become angry because if I meet the right person, well, they're not going to do anything to cause me to be angry. In fact, they're going to kind of fill in all this stuff that I see lacking in my life. And he challenges us, no, 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 you need to become the person that the person you're looking for would be looking for. 
I don't know if you, that's a confusing line, but we've really honed in on that and really been talking about how we should be preparing ourselves to become the person that we would want to be married to, to become that type of person, to focus on us not really finding the right person out there. And the same thing goes for prayer and our relationship with God. Prayer is the, can be and should be the act of, of, of coming before God and letting prayers and that, that presence with God change and come over us. Not so much that, God, you need to change this. Now, before you write off this whole message, I know there's some of you that are kind of already writing it off because of unanswered prayers. Remember, Jesus had unanswered prayers too. Jesus had unanswered prayers too. And weren't answered the way he thought they would, or at least it seems like they're unanswered, like what we go through. Now, if you'd like to talk more, I would love that. This is always my offer. I would love to sit down. I'll, I'll buy a coffee for you. We'll sit down and we'll talk about that. But Jesus goes on and he tells another story here in Luke chapter 18, which I think shows us some things on how to pray. He tells us in this first story, I, I'm, I'm going to teach you to be persistent in prayer, but there are some things that we can gain from this next story about how to pray. So Luke chapter 18, verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. I hope that's not you, but he's already identifying who he's telling this, this parable about. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or, or even like this, this tax collector over here. I fast twice a, a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, the tax collector rather than the Pharisee, who even though the Pharisee was doing all these righteous acts, the tax collector went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I have four things that I think we should really be mindful of when we're praying. And the first, starting right off of here, is humility. I mean, it's just clear as day. Jesus points it out right away. Humility before God. And I think that we can, you can do this. You'll find more of this when we're honest before God. Uh, John Ortberg says, Nothing kills prayer faster than when I pretend to be more noble than I really am. Nothing kills prayer quite as fast as me pretending to be more noble than I really am, right? Now, we lay before him what is in you. And, and, and a lot of times in prayer, we lay before God, we come to God with these words, and we lay before him what we think ought to be in us. Not what really is in us, not the real emotions and the, and the real thoughts and the real feelings that are in us. We're, in a sense, we're lying to God. And God knows it. God sees what's in our heart. You need to be honest with him. There's a Hasidic tale that includes a story of David Din of Jerusalem, who was approached by a man suffering a crisis of belief. And the story goes that, that he was, this, this man was, was talking to David um, and, and just kind of laying all this stuff on him. And whatever reply uh, Reb David attempted, this man dismissed. So Reb David um, restrained himself and simply listened to the man's rant and rave. For hours he listened and finally he said, why are you so angry with God? And the question stunned the man because the man was like, well, I never even said anything about God. And so it was quiet, and then finally the man spoke up and he said, all my life I've been so afraid to express my anger to God that I've always directed that anger towards other people that believed in God, that are connected with God. But until this moment, I did not understand this. Then Reb David stood up and told the man to follow him. He led him to the wailing wall away from the place, away from the place where people pray, to the site of the ruins of the temple. When they reached that place, Reb David told him that it was time to express all the anger he felt towards God. 
Then for more than an hour, the man just beat on the wall and he just screamed his heart out for more than an hour, right? <laughs> and then, but then after, you know, at the end of an hour, his, he is screaming his heart out. His screams turned into cries. And then his cries turned into sobs that just didn't stop. And then his sobs turned into prayers. And that is how Reb David Din taught him how to pray. God can handle your emotions. God can handle what's really inside of you. But don't bottle it up and then don't come before God with, with again, what ought to be in your life. Uh, pay attention to the difference of, of when you're coming to God and you're like, I'm about ready to tell God what I think ought to be in my mind and my heart. Pay attention to the difference, but then tell God what it is and let, let prayer have an, an opportunity to change your heart, just like it changed this guy's heart as he just let out his emotion and eventually that then changed his heart towards God. Being, being proud in prayer, <laughs> being proud in prayer is what's saying what we think ought to be there and not what's really there. Also, don't overcomplicate it. It's very simple. If, if your mind is wandering while praying, like mine does all the time, Maybe God's putting that wandering in there. Pay attention to what, what your mind's wandering to. Is that something that God wants you to be able to, to, to address? Or maybe it's a person that he wants you to pray for, or it's something that he wants you to do. And you don't have to use big words or speak another Christianese language. <laughs> Prayer is simple. Just pray. And that leads me to the fourth thing. So we have humble, we have honest, we have simple, often. Prayer is an expression, maybe proof that we're invited into a relationship with God. Have you thought about that? That God wouldn't have to have created prayer, but he did because he wants to hear from us and he wants a relationship with us. So us coming to God and not being honest doesn't help that relationship. But many of you are discouraged by all this prayer talk, discouraged rather than fired up about um, this. And you're just like, I'm kind of giving up on the whole thing. But let me remind you of this one point. The only way to do prayer wrong, the only way, come on in. The only way to do prayer wrong is to stop doing it. To stop doing it. Mother Teresa says that to learn to pray, you must, okay, get, get your notepad out, get ready to write this down. In order to learn to pray, Mother Teresa says, you must pray. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you want to pray better, pray more. Again, not with many words or repetitions, but, but pray more often. If you are already praying, then you're doing it right. Just keep practicing. There are people that are better at prayer because they've been praying more often. It's not because they can speak Christianese and they say all this kind of stuff. No, that, that Pharisee had prayed a, a whole bunch, but again, his prayers weren't honest and they weren't humble. But that sinner that came before God had the sincere heart cry to be able to, to, to penetrate the throne, the throne of God, to be able to come through there. And God heard that cry and he went away justified. Here's where I find it really discouraging when I'm looking at Christians in prayer. So I'm really talk, honing in on Christians right now, is that history belongs to the prayers. And I don't necessarily see that. <laughs> Honestly, like I said before, I don't know if I would see that even in my own life. I'm a little upset at myself. That history belongs to the prayers. I don't know if you'd look at my prayers if you'd really believe that. History of the story is the story of God giving away power. God giving away power to people who pray. Walter Wink says, history belongs to the intercessors, those who believe and pray the future into being. History does not belong to the powerful or the wealthy or the rulers or the armies or the corporations or the media or whoever the heck we elect as president. <laughs> do you get that? History does not belong to those people. Now, what they do on their own, apart from God, may look impressive. It may look impressive for a time or for all of history or for all of this time on earth, not all of history. 
But the day will come when all merely human actions will be tossed, forgotten, on the ash heap of the dead past. History belongs to the intercessors, to those who believe and pray the future into being. Interceding is what Jesus is doing now. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, yes, who's at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. His, think about this, his teaching ministry lasted three years on earth. His intercessory ministry for us has been lasting 2,000 years, over 2,000 years. If the Bible teaches one thing about prayer, it teaches that prayer changes things. If you're discouraged because of all this talk about prayer, remember that Jesus is, is in the throne. The Bible tells us Jesus is in the throne God, realm of God, just like those, those underlings in the throne in that, that room with the Kadi. They're in there. He, Jesus is in there whispering into the ear of God. Hey, have you not forgotten my servant here who has been praying? who has been praying their heart out. We have that person for us. And we have the Holy Spirit that's even translating our prayers. Even a simple, small prayer, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. The Holy Spirit translates before God and Jesus puts into the ear of God himself. A theologian once remarked that in the Gospels, people approached Jesus with questions 183 times. Whereas he responded with a direct answer only three times. A direct answer only three times. It was as if he wasn't concerned with the answer, but he wanted us to work out the answer for ourselves. And prayer is the journey to do that. Prayer is the journey in which we, we come to the throne room of God, we, we persistently come to the throne room of God, persistently bringing these, these, these requests. We allow prayer to then change us, maybe sometimes rather than changing the situation. And, and we work out these answers for ourselves. Pamela Gray once commented, for one soul that exclaims, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. There are 10 that say, here, Lord, come here, for thy, thy servant speaketh. My desire for you is that, is that for one, you just don't give up on prayer. If, if you're a new Christian, you've been a Christian for a long time, remember that prayer is about honesty, humility, being simple, and praying often. Jesus tells us a story to pray and to not give up and not to come to God before, uh, before him with all this, this pride and arrogance. Be honest. My, my, my desire for you, my, my hope, is that you don't place your hope in other things. I'm seeing a lot of Christians place their hope in or, or finding even life just, I'm going to be honest with you, probably going to get some bad emails for this, but I see a lot of Christians right now, I've had a lot of conversation with Christians that are just hopeless because the election didn't go the way they wanted. And I'm like, that's never who we put our hope in in the first place. No matter if, if the person was, was Carrie, our own Carrie Yeck pastor, it was just a saint, godly man. Well, he would be the first to say he wasn't, but <laughs> it, it, no matter who it was, that's not who I put my hope in, in the office of the president. Now, it'd be nice to have a Christian in there, sure. But that's not where we place our hope. History belongs to the intercessors, the prayers. Do you believe that prayer changes things? Are you open to being the number one thing that prayer changes is you? My desire for you this week is that you don't place your hope in other things. You misplace your hope. Place your hope in Jesus and that you show that with persistent prayer. Thank you so much for joining us.